You now tuned into the hottest podcast in the world, the Stay Woke Podcast, right here on the SonicBreakdown.com. Man, it's time to wake up. Time to wake up. Get this cake up. Get this cake up. Only thing I care about is switching. Welcome back to another Stay Woke Podcast. This is D-Ray Brinson, and you know the Stay Woke Podcast is presented by thesonicbreakdown.com. As always, go over there and check out our articles or reviews at thesonicbreakdown.com. As well as this episode is sponsored by Top Harvest Club. They will be having a release date coming up soon in the next couple of months. So stay tuned and uh, keep an eye out for that. Again, the name is Top Harvest Club. And so let's get in today's topic. Today is going to be, um, we're going back. I haven't done it in a while, but we're coming back to an album review. For this album review, it's going to be uh, our, another new music segment. And it's going to be with Jason Terrell, as, we, uh, as we've done before. So thank you for coming on, man, for this uh, new, uh, I guess, review that uh, we haven't done in a while. It's been a minute, man. Uh, I'm excited about this one. This is going to be good. And so for all of you out there who have followed us on Instagram, which you should, at the Say Well Podcast with D. Ray or the Sonic Breakdown um, on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, and you'll know that this is going to be the J. Cole KOD review. Just to give a little bit of background is we this is uh, the second J. Cole album that we rev- reviewed for the podcast. The first one I did was for the For Your Eyes Only um, which were released, I think, the day it was released. This time, I took a little bit more time, a week, to kind of sit with it. I, I felt like this was so lyrically dense, as well as so, um, so just so dense in material and content that I, I needed the time to really parse through it. But if you, as well as if you know, I am a J. Cole fan, but with all of our reviews, I try to be as objective um, as I can be. So... Yeah, I've been listening to Cole back to his mixtape days with The Come Up, which came out in 2007, and The Warm Up, which came out in 2009, and then followed his career ever since. You, you're, you're in, that same, in that same space, correct? When did you start following Cole or listening to his music? Probably uh, around 2007, 2008. Okay. Um, I really got into him pretty heavy. So I think the first, I know the project for me that really stood out was uh, uh, Friday Night Lights. Yeah, yeah. That's... Um, that, was, that was my favorite right there. Yeah, that that's... was... That was uh, that's everybody's yeah. go-to. <laughs> yeah, yes, it is. Yeah, that was, that was it for me. To briefly go back, I, I just want to say I I gave him a uh, I gave him a favorable favorable review for For Your Eyes Only, which um, it wasn't received in the masses quite the same way as how I received it. I thought it was a, a very good project. I thought it was very introspective and um, more adult content, where you really had to sit down and and absorb it versus some other music that we we have gotten from J. Cole where, you know, the, you just vibe to the beat and then if you catch the lyrics, you get the deeper meaning. But if you don't, you still um, can go with the vibe. What was your feelings about his last project before we get into this new one? Yeah, so I was, uh, I think I reviewed that one or maybe um, I probably talked about it a lot. But <laughs> I didn't too much care for that one. I, you know, that it was still a good, a good project. You know, when I say I didn't care for it, meaning that as far as like the projects that came out that year, um, and still on the caliber of like the you know, rap in general was still high up there for me. But as far as um on my J. Cole kinda like discography, like it wasn't one of my favorite projects of him. Um a lot of that was because it wasn't it was a lot more perspective, a little slower. It felt like it was very targeted to like a specific audience. Yeah. Or a specific like, you know, specific kind of topic and theme. So it wasn't my favorite of the, of the Cole projects, but Honestly, it was still a good project to me compared compared to like everyone else that's kind of out here right now. You know, let's get right into it. Let's get right into his latest album, which was released on 420, and it's called KOD. Let's get right into the title before we get into the actual tracks itself. I actually, I want to get into the title and the cover art um, before we yeah. dive into the the content of the album. The title has three meanings, and that was confirmed by J Cole on Twitter. One of the meanings is kids on drugs. The other one is King Overdose, and then the last one is Kill Our Demons. And all of those definitely are highlighted and captured in the content of this album. What did you think of, of those three titles or the three meanings of the title? Yeah, they're all, you know, very powerful, you know, very powerful themes. And all, all of them were really captured very well on the cover art as well. Um, the front cover and the back cover of, of the project. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, the, the kids on drugs, I mean, that stood out the most just because it was, uh, and there's like a little disclaimer on the cover art right above, uh-huh, Yeah. you know, but to me that, that stood out the most just because it was, you know, kids obviously, you know, doing drugs or whatever. So 
Yeah, I mean, I, I automatically going in, and especially in the dropped on 420, I knew some of the messages were going to be kind of targeted or tailored towards that. For me, I wouldn't say any of the three meanings stick out more than the other because I saw the interconnection of all of the three titles. And I'm, I'm just kind of briefly break down how I viewed the meanings of each of these titles. Kids on Drugs, I took that as how entertainers are praising drug culture so much that, you know, the kids are seeing it as that way of not as a danger or something to be cautious of, but more as an enjoyable, uh, something that everybody indulges in. How how present it is in hip hop culture and, and just in uh, society as right now in general. And then... The King Overdose kind of ties into that of how society is pushing that drug culture so strong that it's, it's, it's omnipresent. It's everywhere. You can't escape it. So it's like you're overdosing on the messages, not just only the drugs itself, but the messages that society is giving us. Um, it's how I kind of internalized it. And then Kill Your Demons of basically taking those first two aspects and, and figuring out how to, how to way to not allow it to have such a hold on us that as we see in society, it does like uh, prescription drugs, uh, just drug culture in, in general is a major issue in, in American culture in in society as a whole, specifically in America and finding ways to deal with those demons. And not only just those demons, but the real issues in the reason why you go to those drugs in the first place. Cause usually there's an underlying uh, reason that you're trying to either cope as as he says in the when we get into it later, the intro of choose wisely. There's there are several ways to deal with this pain, and it seems like the go to or the the only avenue that the newer generation seems like they can go to is drugs. Um, so that's kind of the the quick and, and dirty version of what I took from those um, three different meanings. I wanted to also touch on the the cover art too because I thought that was it kind of set the tone. Like the three meanings set the tone of the content that's in it. And the cover art set the tone of that it is that there is some satirical and parody in it. The way that you have the pictures of the kids, all the kids doing different types of drugs, weed, cocaine, pills yeah. or prescription pills, and it's leading to death. And all that is covered in the shroud of entertainment, of materialism, gaudiness, mm. uh, flamboyancy, as you see Cole with the crown on. But the other aspect of it is Cole's eyes are white it out like he doesn't even realize yeah. you know what i'm saying like he's which was another aspect of it like that these entertainers not only are they pr pushing this message but they're also using it as well so they're they're not they're not separated from it they're in it as well um i just yeah. all that together i thought uh led to a, just a lot of conversation alone off the cover art and the title or the, the meanings of the titles so it had me very interested into you know, getting into them, the meat of the, the content. Is there anything else you wanted to add before we started getting into uh, the, the tracks and starting with the title track or the, the initial no, no, track, I mean, the track? And that's, that's a good analysis of the cover of the title, the title messages and meanings. Yeah, I'm interested to see, you know, as this conversation kind of goes on, but even your thoughts about how, how I don't think last year um, there was a, a young rapper that, that died, forget his name, from Odin. Oh. Um, but how much of that is like has been a part of our culture part of hip-hop culture you know i remember reading one something saying that maybe the rap has changed from the main rappers now are, are the drug users versus you know the 90s the 2000s like the drug dealers but it kind of has, has always been a part of that that culture before we move on i wanted to that's something that i did notice and i did that i that i was going to bring up later but might as well do it now is what you were talking about of how that that shift in culture it used to be as a uh, I guess a, a, another analogy is uh, the Jay Z line is, uh, yeah, you used to respect the shooter, now you respect the the dude that got shot. That transition yeah. from, like you said, we used to respect the drug dealer, now we're respecting the drug user. Yeah, and you can get into a bigger debate about it and say that that is a result of that drug dealer conversation because if you're telling everybody to be drug dealers, the drug dealers have to sell to somebody. And then yeah, th sure. those people that they're selling to are the ones that are still listening to the music. And in order for that transaction to work, there has to be more drug users than drug dealers. So those people that are the drug users grow up. And then what do you think they're going to be talking about? Using the drugs. <laughs> so I just, it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic and it's, it's an interesting uh, path that 
we can try to try to map out and find out what is the cause or but there's so many different causes and so many re- different reasons as a result of that but yeah Instead of spending all day on that, let's get uh, right into this this album. And I want to start out with um, actually before before I do that, I want to just preface all of those out there that there is going to be spoilers. Of course, this is a review. Uh, I still say you should listen to this review as well as listen to the album and get your own interpretation and let us know what you think about it. Um, let us know if we missed anything. And of course, this album just came out, so there's going to be a lot of intricacies and uh, interpretations that we're not going to be able to pick up because we just haven't sat with it long enough. So just uh, keep that in mind. (laughs) I really want to break down each track because it's only 12 tracks that ended up about 43 minutes. But let's start with that first track, the intro track. What were, what were your, what's your feelings on on that track in particular or that, that intro uh, setting you up for what you're going to hear? Uh, I think the the thing that said me was how it was a, you know, a very kind of eerie sounding towards the end. Like it's kind of, kind of set up this idea that there's always two roads, kind of like the road less travel, but there's, there's two paths to choose wisely. Make sure you, you know you're, you're steering in the right direction. So I think it was a, a good song. I mean, related back to the title thing, to the title relates back to the uh, to the cover art as well. So to me, it, it fit right nice, you know, fit very nicely within the whole theme of the album. Um, for me, I, I felt that same thing. I felt that there was an ominous presence that was felt throughout the that that was propelled through the production, and then the vocals used by the narrator, I'll, I'll call her, was also ominous. But it felt as if it's foreshadowing, of course, foreshadowing and and forewarning, which I thought was interesting, especially for an intro. And the jazz feel gave it a sort of satirical, sort of parody feel. Like if you yeah. were watching a movie you would already know that, you know, something is going to be uh, put put in a satirical way or, or a parody um, just by the, the sonic properties of that intro. That's, or at least that's what I felt. Yeah, and, yeah I agree with you, yeah. And the, one of the, the other things that really stuck out to me was um, how they broke down the two rawest and realest emotions that everybody experiences, love and pain, and re- referred it to, and, and how they came up with that that is the the raw emotions because mm. a baby can express it even without knowing yeah. what they're expressing. So I just thought that was very interesting in setting up that, as you said, those there, there's, there's several roads to, to deal with it with pain. And, and that's the other thing that I noticed too, is that out of those two rawest forms of emotion, he was focusing on one. The name yeah, was the pain. Yeah. The pain, um, which I thought was, was very interesting. Then let's segue that into the second track, which is the title track, K.O.D. Uh, for me, the, the production had that heavy bass, and it had a, yeah, yeah. a, a laid-back feeling, but there was a, a pulse of aggression. Or, um, I don't, actually, I won't even say aggression, but pulse of energy that keeps the beat moving, that takes away from the laid-back feeling to me a little bit, but I think is needed in regards to what he's saying. And for me, I just took that as... Like he's painting the scene again. Uh, that's another reason why I really enjoy Cole's music is because of the storytelling aspect of it. And I'm really big on storytelling. I've said it a million times on this podcast that that's really the thing that I resonate with. And um, with this uh, track, K.O.D., he really paints that picture of like what it's like growing up and to see like the society, what, what society's holding as important, like painting that view of. Like I said, how society's pushing this drug culture, how society's pushing these negative things, how society's pushing materialism, how society's pushing capitalism, all these things that when you boil it down back to the two raw forms of emotions, none of that shit really matter. Like, none of that shit matters when you boil it down to those yeah. two raw emotions, love and pain. So that's really what I took from this initial track. What about, what about you? Or not the initial track, but the title track. What about you? I want to um, kind of echo what you're saying, but the, the thing that stood out to me about this track was his flow on it. Because mm-hmm. um, like, to me, the, the, the production was crazy. I love the beat for this. Yeah. And he was able to kind of flow on that, especially the chorus, and then transition from the chorus to the verse. Ooh, um, fire. Kind of switching up the flow a little bit. It was fire. Um, it was, I, I love this track. It was good. The thing that was also interesting on here is that on that intro track, how they were focusing on the pain, the last thing that they focused on on KOD was love. That th- that was the most important thing is love. Um, so that duality uh, between love and pain, they still made it very present even on the following track. I yeah. thought that was an, an, an inter- interesting spot. Let's move on to uh, the third track 
photographer? Or what stood out on that shot so to I, you? Yeah, I mean, so I first listened, <laughs> you know, it reminded me a lot of, uh, you know, scrolling on Instagram, looking at, uh, mm-hmm. you know, looking at photos. Yeah. Just, it's something all, all of us can relate to, but I'm just kind of the idea of, of shit, it's not really at the end of the day. That's kind of what I got from it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's something that we all could kind of fit, you know, relate to and fit in. So I, I appreciate, like, the same song you, like, feel in the time, almost like a ballad to a degree. Yeah, but I, I like this one a little smooth. Yeah, I thought this was I thought this was real smooth, and I thought, like I said on um, KOD, the they ended with focusing on love, and it's interesting that on this track, they they carry that love idea, but that we're directing it in the wrong places. We're directing mm, that love. That's the point. Yeah, we're we're, we're, we're uh, excuse me. We're directing that love to pictures, and as he said, picture that we're not even sure if that's the person that we're actually communicating with. We're not sure if that's right. even a real picture. Just the love of, we're we're falling in love with the exterior physical attributes instead of the more important things. Again, going back to the two raw things, the emotional aspect of it, the the emotional attachment to it, and this love that we have for the visual is expressed through, as you said, through social media, Instagram, and even to the point of how we fall in love, Tinder. Mm. It's you're I mean, you're swiping agree. you're swiping through a picture, not even. That's again, you're focusing on the 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 physical, and that's how you're uh, uh, attaining this love. Where think about prior to social media, prior to the 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 social media buzz and internet boom, people were interacting with people. That's how you met somebody. Is yeah, you might see them and find them attractive, but then you start to talk to them, get to know them, and you found out who they were, and that's the people that you fall in love with is the people that you have something in common with. Uh, you know, there's several different reasons why people fall in love with who they fall in love with. But most of those were through human interactions that allowed you to develop yeah. those connections to determine if you do love them. And so I just thought that was um, uh, just an interesting, because just like you, I, the first thing I thought about was Instagram. And then as I was going through the track and he was talking about um, love and falling in love and uh, shooting my shot you know, shoot my shot in a break. It's like, you know, you, you slid in her DM, she didn't hit you back or you, <laughs> yeah. know, you swipe right. She didn't swipe back or whatever side it is. I don't know what it is for Twitter swipe right or left, whatever it is. You swipe to the side and she didn't swipe, you know, to, you know, to build that interaction. But I just thought that you was know, an interesting perspective. Yeah. The, the thing around that is, um, you know, it's kind of the idea of, I wonder if this could be also, you know, another drug as well. Like mm-hmm. how do we say it kind of messes with his health? Um, and that could be in a literal sense. Like I know sometimes it would be like social media or to Instagram or whatever I'm on it to the point where it becomes too much, too much input, you know, it's like too much going on. I, I spend a lot of, a lot of time, mm-hmm. you know, looking at it. So, so I have to like purposely like either like Pull not away. look yeah. at it or, or delete it off my phone for a couple of days just to kind of like reset it myself. Um, yeah. so it, it could be, you know, another, another vice that he's talking about. And, and I think, I think that's a, that's a great point. And research have shown that, they're creating those apps in a manner to make them addictive. Their endorphins are released when you see how many likes people put on your Instagram post. They specifically hold. So when you go to your Instagram or right, like if you went one second, let's say I liked a picture on your page, you might not see that because they batch them together. So they'll hold your likes so that you get a bigger rush of endorphins instead of seeing, you know, you get a little rush of endorphins because you saw one like every, let's say 30 minutes. But if they hold it, and then in an hour, they give you 20 likes instead of those one likes every, you know, couple of minutes. Mm. It releases more endorphins, which gets you to stay on Instagram longer and to check it more often. So it is a vice and it is have, which takes us into another realm of, you know, the, the psychological effects that, you know, social media and these are having. Because even just in that example of how we find love, it has to have a psychological effect on us. Because we're doing it differently. Yeah. So, therefore, if you're doing it differently, it's going to affect you differently. And I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying it's bad. But it's going to have some effect. And from my perspective, I would think that it's going to be more negative because we're we're focusing so much on just the exterior versus the interior. The real, like I said, the meat of a person is what they're about and who they are, yeah. not what they look like. Yeah. Let's move on to uh, the cutoff next, which I think – like the layout of this uh, of the albums, and that's always intriguing to me too. Is the layout of albums? If if people have listened to the other podcast, you might notice that I kind of find leading trends of why I think they might have laid out the album in the order that they did. 
And going from photography to the cutoff, it kind of seems fitting because, like he said, uh, you know, I shoot my shot in the bricks. Like, you slide in that DM and you don't get it, so you got cut off. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, maybe I can see that, yeah. Um, so let's go right into this this one. What did you think about uh, this this track, the cutoff? Oh man, this is uh, this is one of my favorite tracks on here. Yeah, me too. Um, and that it was kind of um, I mean, particularly like the the chorus and like the bridge. Mm. So one of the things I was um interested in knowing is who this who Kill Edward is. Uh, I heard that some people say that's like J Cole's alter ego or kind of J Cole's uh, you know, that, that is him, just kind of him in a different format. Um, but again, this is one of my favorite tracks. But I love to get your idea about um about him basically i found the same thing because uh there was a track that was released i think it was last year by kill edward and people were under the assumption that that was j cole i I have a feeling that it is j cole just um altering his voice and trying to trying to branch out a little bit into more um just just different you know expanding his his uh his musical range i think and uh that was another thing that i did want to um mention that i forgot to mention about kod is his voice acting i i feel like i get more i'm getting more division in his uh voice patterns and and him changing his voice than we've gotten on previous albums and i think specifically for this one i think it was needed because it it added to the story of of providing different perspectives and with those pr- perspectives, the changes in voices it just added to it. It made it more like, like, like a piece, like a, a Broadway piece. Um, going back to the, the satirical or parody, it felt more stage like than if he didn't. Um, so I just wanted to mention that, and I think Kill Edward adds to that. And I think I, I agree with you one hundred percent. I think it is his. I think it's kind of like his inner voice. It is. Um, alter ego but i think that kill edward is his inner voice that the that inner voice that you you hear but you don't necessarily want it spoken in public that kind of yeah that, that's my take and, on and, it. and actually I, I thought that kind of the same thing especially around like how this track was broken down like kind of and, and this track like the i guess kill edward the mm-hmm. alter ego was like give me drink give me smoke yeah. like kind of give me all the negative things um and then he would come in and, and, and spit out of like uh you know one one or two bars, like one or two, uh, um, two verses. But as far as like that inner voice, like the inner voice kept telling him like the negative things, mm-hmm. like give me this, give me that. If I die, nobody would know. Kind of almost that kind of you know, like you said, the the double voice in your in your head. Yeah. The other thing that I took that I really really enjoyed about this track is is the production. Is it had that old school '90s vibe with uh, the lower BPMs, and then his flow, man, that flow, just the the cadence. Even and the same thing with the chorus, the cadence of uh, Kill Edwards, aka alter ego, alter ego J Cole. That cadence, that pace, that that rhythm, it just is very infectious, and it's a very introspective feeling track. And I tend to mm-hmm. I tend to um, resonate with those tracks as well. And lyrically, for me, it's just like getting to the point that you could where you obtain this fame, this whatever your career is like that where you're at that point in your life and you realize like you've outgrown certain people and that can be a bad thing or it can be. So you're, you have to cut at at some points in life, you get to a point where you outgrown people and you do have to cut them off. And that's kind of where I took the, the, the lyrical aspect of it of, because there's certain lines in there where he's saying like, you know, like I, I, I I have a big heart and I want to give so much, but at the end of the day, like you're not even appreciating that this is what I'm giving you is literally from the heart. It's not just because I'm in a position to give. I'm giving it because I want to, and I, I it's genuine. And you're taking advantage of that because you're just coming back and asking. You're not even showing appreciation for what I'm doing. I think that is important because I, I feel like any point in, in in your life, and I had to done it. I have I had to do it myself. Is um you know starting my businesses and things. There are certain people that didn't understand my vision, didn't understand my grind, and it's not that I have no love or loss for you, but I don't have time for the negativity. So if you're not, I don't need you necessarily to go out of your way to help me get there. But if you're doing stuff to impede me, you one of the people that got to get cut off. Um, yeah, that's true. And, and yeah, I, I relate to that line as well. And so that's that's kind of uh, that line uh, really like stuck to me because similar to uh, to what he says in that line and 
Dave East and uh, Nas actually spoke about it on the Rapture uh, documentary as well of wanting to get back to your hood. But like at some point, you can't you can't save the hood. You can't save the whole hood by yourself. No. And feeling that that guilt and that angst about, you know, that you want to give, but you can't. And I felt I, there was times, like I said, I felt guilty about having to cut some people off as a result of, you know, trying to reach where I want to reach. But I, I, I persevered through it. And and at, like, at the end of the day, I think it, it, it matters. I think it's it's only bad if you have some malicious or negative intent about it when you cut the to cut the people you have to cut off. If you're cutting them off because, again, you're trying to reach something and it's positive intentions and it's not necessarily that. I also think in those situations, you have to give people the opportunity to try to rise to the level at which you're trying to do. Like I said, if you're telling them you're trying to reach this vision and they're not with it, they don't necessarily have to be with it. But as long as they're not against you, you don't necessarily have to cut them off. I don't know. It's 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 a those things, kind of things are delicate and intricate things and i can see it from both sides yeah it's a balance to it yeah that's really what i took from uh the cutoff is that's like i said that's what really resonated with me just that idea of getting to a point where you have to cut people off or cut things off it doesn't necessarily have to be people um you know it could be things as well uh, that might be impeding your mm. your your path to success or whatever it is that you're trying to be it, it might be enlightenment whatever yeah. whatever that is and the course repeatedly putting out those vices that are used to cope with the pain, I think just added uh, just another profound aspect to it of, like you said, like he's saying in there, he's trying to do good. Even with doing good, there's still some pain associated with it. And how do you deal and with maybe, that pain? You know, you know so maybe it's like an old, maybe like, you know, I'm thinking about how the title could relate to like, the give me drink, give me some more. Like that's, those are things that you got to cut off, yeah. you know, like kind of cut it off. Maybe I, it sounds like it might be an old to just, you know, like you said, maybe it might not be people. And, and the verse he kind of talks about his, like, his relationship with others. But mm -hmm. again, some of the vices that he mentioned, you know, you just have to cut it off in order to kind of get ahead. Yeah. I mean, like I said, that's really one of my favorite favorite tracks off the, off the album. Next, we have ATM, which uh, I think is probably the most known song now just because of the video and, and just yeah. the, the uh, catchiness of, of the chorus. Count it up, count it up, count it. Uh, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> like that again. Th this song is really catchy. It's really it's the feeling that I got from the production aspect is very playful, fun, energetic, uh, yeah. carefree. That kind of feeling. And then when that was matched with the video, the production alone and and the way that uh, J Cole is flowing on it is so Busta Rhymes. Uh, that yeah. is that is the I feeling. That. And then when I saw the video, it's. That's basically it's a homage to uh, "Give Me Some More," that that video with Busta Rhymes. You know, um, I will never forget that video because uh, I after that when I, I remember first seeing that Busta Rhymes video, and I w I don't know why that line stuck out with me, but I would go around saying, "I bumped my head, I bumped my head," and then I woke up and I was like, "Flip mode, <laughs> flip mode's the greatest, flip mode's the greatest of all." Like I don't know why that particular part really stuck with me, but. I would just quote that all the time. So that why that's why that video uh, resonated with me, and it brought me back to the, those feelings that I had about the Puzzle Rhymes video. But mm. like I said, the production was so playful, had that energy feel to it, and then the the lyrics and the the, the concept of oh, it. Man. Yeah. I just I thought it was very eye opening and provided, and the way that he that he presented it, I feel like people will resonate with it and take the deeper meaning that I don't think they would have necessarily accepted in another form. Um, what is, what is your feelings mm -hmm. about this, this song, the production, uh, the lyrics? I mean, yeah, yeah, everything. I think, um, again, one of my favorites as well, like to me, like the beat was automatically catching. So I, yeah. I was automatically like, you know, drawn in, just like kind of by the playful beat. And then the video on top of that was a good kind of portrayal of like, kind of like the fun atmosphere, kind of trippy atmosphere that you were kind of creating um, a little wonky, a little bit in the video, but yeah. <laughs> um, you know. But as far as the lyrics, I mean, like, so basically, like the money's not going to, you know, idea. But money isn't. We spend our whole lives trying to to get that. And some people look at it. That is their drug too. Is is chasing the dollar. But you know, still at the end of the day, it might not. It, it, you know, is it worth losing your soul? Kind of thing. I think one of the verses in there. Well, no, I think it was a verse one or verse two. Anyway, it's kind of talking about the idea that you know, money is like a money has a hole in your heart. 
you know, it leaves a hole in your heart. It's like kind of like, fuck it, I'll eat the whole cake. Like, I'll, I'll take the whole thing. Like, yeah. it's just an organ. Um, like, you know, just forget it. So kind of the idea that p- people have this, this dream of, of chasing the money, going after the money, even though you lose your soul, um, you know, you lose your soul doing so. I mean, you were spitting on this, but I agree with you. I don't think you would have, if you would have presented it in another form, it wouldn't have resonated. Because this doesn't, doesn't come off as preachy. You know, it doesn't come off as like, you know, kind of sending or I'm telling you what to do. It's just like, you know, he's just kind of spitting, but it's, it's kind of you know, satirical. It's kind of funny, but definitely makes you think a little bit. Yeah. That reminded me of the study that they did, I, I, I want to say in the last couple of months, uh, uh, well, actually, I don't know when the study was done, but I just remember reading about it the last couple of months. So sorry, I can't provide you the source and where I got this information. But the information stated that basically, I think it was anything over $110,000 does not increase your happiness, your level of happiness. Like that's yeah, yeah. that's the point. That. Yeah, that's the point. So anything above that or anything, uh, yeah, anything above that, your happiness is is relative on you and how you internalize that happiness. So it just, it, to me, like that fit it because an, another thing that I've talked about with, um, especially when it comes to money, materialism and everything like that is, yes, uh, and, and he touches on this about the duality of money is, yes, we need it to live. Yes, that's, that's, that's a given because we live in a, a, a capitalistic society and that's, that's a, how we function in that society. Yeah. But at the same time, what's the point? Because I, I brought this up before about, you know, if you're a multimillionaire, what is the drive for you to become a billionaire? Because, like, really, at what point, at what point do you say it's enough? Like, if you're a multimillionaire, there's really not much you can get that, yeah. that, that uh, you know, if you're, let's say you have $50 million in the bank, somebody that has $60 million, y'all both about getting the same thing. Like yeah, it is ten more. It's ten more million dollars, which is a lot of money. Don't get me wrong, but in the gist of things of what you can actually purchase and 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 get done, you're there's really no difference. Like <laughs> you can still fly wherever you want to. Yeah. So like at, th- that's what I mean. But yet there's still people that are multimillionaires that are trying to be billionaires, and there's billionaires that are trying to be multi-billionaires. It's like where where's that point? At what level does it stop? Yeah. What level does it stop? Because as you said, it's gonna. That that's where I think he's talking about that hole is because you're trying to fill some void with the money, and the money is not gonna fill that void. So you're always gonna be chasing that. And so I've been in a lot. I've been in a, growing up. There's been a lot of bad situations that I've been in. There's like even one point when me, my mom, and my brothers were living in a homeless shelter. And you would think, being a young, a, a child in that situation. But I was old enough to realize where we were at and how it was viewed. Like, I was embarrassed of it, you know, going to school. Like, I didn't want – I did everything I could to make sure nobody knew. You know what I'm saying? So I was all conscious of how society viewed people in those circumstances. But as a child, I had nothing to do – I couldn't change it. And I know my mother was doing the best she could, so we wouldn't be in that situation. So it's like I'm not mad at her because of that. I'm mad at the situation. But at the same time, even in those desperate situations, there was points of happiness. Yeah. So that means that money does not relate to your happy. You know what I'm saying? Like you can you can attain happiness without money, and so therefore it's about a mindset, and that's kind of how I how I took this the ATM and and just internalizing that that yes you do need it to live. Don't be a fool. You know, try to have a job. Try to have a good job so you can sustain the level of life that you want. But don't let it overcome you, and so that's like I said. That that's why it really resonated with me in, in, to that regard. Yeah. Let's go on to uh, motivate, which also I, I feel <laughs> rides or or uh, build off that energy created by ATM. It uh, does, yeah, it does. To me, it flows into it. Perfectly. Yeah, very nicely. And motivate is follows ATM, which is crazy because money is a lot of people's motivation. <laughs> is is yeah. you know that that what motivates a lot of people uh is is money and then the other interesting aspect of this as well taking all those components together is the eight at the end of the motivate which i took as representing an eight ball for a certain amount of cocaine that that he kind of uh alludes to later another track moving from uh weed to uh cocaine later what did what was your your ideas and, and feelings about motivate 
Motivate kind of talks about, at least the lyrics, you know, it was almost a kind of glorification of what money would get you, you know, mm-hmm. can't get you, will get you. Um, although ATM was a little, it kind of talked about it from a more of the negative from the point of view. Mm-hmm. Um, Motivate was a little more positive, you know, in terms of just like, not necessarily positive, but it's showing more of the glorification of it. But like, I mean, it, it's perfect what you said. Like to me, is you asked the question, like, you know, would stop, you know, you know, where's the cutoff? Like, you know, why would you, you have 10, you know, 10 million, you know, you need a hundred million. Um, like, you know, what is that? Why, why do you need that? But to me, like the idea, like money motivates you. That, that is like the motivate, you know, the idea that you can pull up and go to the DR with, you know, like you say, you have a meal and your briefcase. Like to me, that, that is why you do it. It's like, you know, you want that, you want that to a degree. Now, whether or not it's, is, is, you know, whether or not that's something that, that really truly fills you up or whether that is just you like falling into another vice, like that's another question, but he does paint more of like the kind of the glorification of it though. Yeah. And actually what you just brought up made me think of when you think of the greats in any field, I can't think of any of the greats that ever said that the money was their motivation. Mm. If you like Michael Jordan, he wanted to be, it wasn't about the money. He wanted to get the money, but it was about he wanted to be literally just the best basketball the best. player in the world. The best 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 yeah. basketball player ever. Muhammad Ali just wanted to be the best boxer he could be. Go go to even, you know, geniuses. Albert Einstein, he wasn't interested in money. Yeah. <laughs> so like I, I I can't think of anybody that reads the level of greatness, Prince, Michael Jackson. Their 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 focus wasn't money. It was being the best artist they could be. You know what I'm saying? Like so I, I can't think of anyone that made it to the levels of greatness where money was their motivation. That's, that's just, true. that's, that's an interesting idea because we, we, we certainly are. J Cole gives us the impression that money isn't his motivation. And yet we praise him for the level of work that he does. And we put him over artists that clearly money is their motivation. Yeah, that's true. And the other thing that it did um, notice and that I, Actually, actually, I'll ask you that. Do you think that the repetition of "get money," you know, the um, the Biggie sample, do you think that was? I was thinking that that might be a uh, kind of a, I guess, an acknowledgement of the subliminal effects that society trying to give on us. Uh, because if you really look at the production, the production is very simple and s- simplistic production. It's is great production. Don't get me wrong. It's, but it's simplistic if you in comparison to other tracks on this album. And then that get money line is pushed throughout. Yeah, it is. You know, kind of that subliminal of like, that's how society is saying, because that's in essence what society does. Every time they put on ads about, you know, with a skinny model or lining up, they're sending subliminal messages that, you know, you should be lighter, you should be skinnier, you should buy this product, you should try to get more money, the capitalist movement. What what did you think about that, um, just that sample being in there? No, no, I, I can see that. To me, it seems like it was like almost like the, Kill Edward, the other, other, you know, your <laughs> other side kind of talking to you in your head. Like, you want to motivate, you want to motivate, but it's like, like, get money. You know, even if some of the words were like, he didn't finish motivating, once yeah. older, and then he started get get money. Yeah. And so it was almost like the idea, it's kind of like you mentioned, that you can, you can strive for something, but business, capitalism, money gets into the way always. And sometimes that taints people. Um, and then you match that <laughs> with, 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 with drugs. So it's almost like this, this revolving cycle, but. I can definitely see that. Like, it talks about some of the, it's almost like you, you, money, the idea of money is pushed on you to the point where you're glorifying it. Yeah. Yeah. Glorifying it almost almost to the point that we're worshiping it. That is almost become an yeah. idol, um, in essence. So that that's, I, I didn't even think about that, that about that, you know, the how much we praise it to the, almost to the point of worship. Let's segue this into, uh, I guess, uh, Kevin's heart, I guess, is the most, that's the one that people are people are talking to me about the most is Kevin Hart. Um his just first of all, let's go to the production aspect of it. First, Kevin Hart. Kevin's Hart is, you know, play on word on Kevin Hart and kind of the the issue or uh unfaithful event that he had, which I thought was also big on Kevin's Kevin Hart's part that yeah, he's 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 open so. enough to say like, well, he already, um, you know, validated the story, but now to what extent he validated, I'm not going to get into that, but he, he already came out, you know, apologized, all that stuff, but still to put himself in a position where one, the song's going to bring, bring it up again. The video is going to bring it up again for him to still say, yeah, let's do it because 
like that's to me it shows a, a level of remorse from him because if you weren't remorseful why would you want to put yourself in a position where it has to be brought up again you want to be you want to remove your way, yourself away from it as furthest away as you can and and basically act as if it never happened you know what i'm saying but he him being yeah. that open about it uh, i think just shows a, a true level of remorse before we get into the production what did you think about just that whole that aspect of it of you know it's a art imitating life and life imitating art like that the fact that it, this is Kevin's true life. Yeah, this is. I mean, this is real. I mean, but yeah, I, mean, I think it was one. I, I really respect him for even like, you know, one admitting to this, and then you know, being a part of the video, almost being a part of the the production of it, being mm -hmm. a part of the art form. I mean, to me, I, you know, I love this song. It's pretty personal to me. It's like have my own personal issues with like relationships and mm -hmm. cheating and doing different things, and so like a lot of the things that he mentioned, like you know. This idea of temptation, like yeah. that's also the drug. And to me, I think, you know, some people, you know, that's, that could be advice to a lot of people. I know definitely for me, like that, that's something, you know, I struggle with. So trying to think through how do you always keep yourself, like, you know, away from temptation, away from that. Pretty probably you kind of mentioned and tapped on. So this idea of choose wildly at the beginning, I know that was in the video, like at, in the clouds or whatever yeah. at the end. But even at the beginning, like this idea of choose wildly continues to come up I'm in every situation. I definitely agree with you. I thought it was it was interesting in that regard of, like you said, temptation. And when I first heard it, again, I didn't see the video until recently. So I was listening to the track several times, and I automatically, you know, the title itself, Kevin's Heart. And then when I was listening to it, I, I was kind of where you were, where I was like, I, I get that it's about temptation, but I didn't necessarily get that it was completely about, uh, uh, you know, adultery, um, you know, uh, cheating on your on your spouse. I knew it had, I guess the best way to put it is, I knew that it was about that, but I didn't quite get, the way that he presents it, it's not quite laid out as in, yes, I did cheat. It's about, the the way that he presents the, the to me is, like you said, it's about the temptations, about, you know, the girl sending you a text or sending you a DM and you ignore it and they keep on calling you, they keep on texting you, they keep, you know, keep on, and if it's not that one, it's another one. When you go away, you know, you're not with your significant other, so you're away from it, you you feel, you know, maybe I can get away with it, or maybe I, I have a need, a quote-unquote sexual need, that I need to have fulfilled. All those things, that's what I was taking away from what he was saying, and that basically, like, we're tempted all the time, but... You got to just realize, you know, at the end of the day, because he's like, if, if I if I take the cookie, I'm going to do the time. So just yeah. under, understand that, like with everything, you choose wisely. There is going to be a consequence regardless of what choice you make. Is that choice, is, is that consequence something you can live with? And that's that's kind of where I took it is. Uh, and, and the same thing with the video, even though the video highlighted more the fact that he actually did cheat. And he's trying to cover up them since because actually, let me take that back. When I heard the song, I took it as, like I said already, when I saw the video, I took it as, I took it differently. I took it as, um, hmm. as a man not trying to live by his greatest failing. Hmm. And what I mean by that is you can be in a loving relationship and yes, you succumb to that temptation. That doesn't mean that you're going to continuously come to that temptation. One, exactly. and yeah. two, you might with everything like, you know, you fall down because you didn't see us there. Well, OK, I'm going to consciously make an effort to do better. So I don't do that again. The same thing in that situation. I'm going okay, to consciously make an effort that I will not make this mistake again because I love my wife. I love my girlfriend. I love my significant other that much that regardless of what this cookie is. I don't want to sacrifice and losing something a lot more because that goes to the conversation of if your spouse cheated on you, would you stay with them or would you leave? And I think that's a touchy situation. Yeah. And I think that's dependent on it, uh, on this, the relationship, but that's where I was kind of taking it is she stayed with Kevin Hart because maybe she felt that that one mistake he made does not outweigh all of the positives that he's done and all the positives that he might continue to do if he does truly have remorse and want to be and and not make that mistake again. Yeah, I feel you. I mean, to me, I think like when I think about all, kind of like the uh, I mean, throughout throughout the uh, the album, it's always like a little voice, a little you know, person on your mm -hmm. side, a little voice in your head. Um, but like the chorus, one thing that kind of stuck out was like, "Feel like you know, my girl got a diploma, and then you're a smoke." 
You yeah. Know? So it's almost like, you know, the image is, there's always something in your mind telling you, you know, he's like, send me, send me a Zanny at once. And it's like somebody, like, almost like crying out from inside. And it's almost like trying to battle that. You know, your girl's got the poem, she's good, she, she's supposed to be the one for you, but still in the back of your mind, it's telling you, like, fuck this shit up, basically, and do what you want to do. But, you know, one of the things that he mentioned was, like, some of my, my granddad used to always tell me, anything you do in the dark will always come to the light. Yep. And that's something that was throughout the song. It's like, you know, whatever you do in the dark, it's going, it's going to come out eventually. Yeah. It might not be now. You take that cookie, you eventually do that now, time. But eventually. It's, it's going to happen, always. That's, just, that's something I do believe in. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, this song hit, hit home with a, for a lot of ways, but it's definitely one of my favorites on the, uh, on the album. Yeah, mine too. The last thing I want to do before we transition to uh, brackets is the last part of that song is where he talks about, I can't see myself when I look in the mirror. And to me, that's talking mm-hmm. about that, that true remorse that I was talking about. Like, you're so disgusted with yourself by the mistake that you made, you don't want to even want to face yourself. Yeah. Because I think that's the other aspect of it that I was saying before about, you know, if you're in a relationship and you're cynic and other cheats, a lot of people just say, oh, I'm, I, I'm, de- I'm out. Once a cheater, always a cheater. But as we've seen with other people's relationships, that's not always necessarily the case. There's a lot of factors that go into it. Maybe y'all were together when you were really young, and as a young man, you feel like you might be missing out on something of your prime years, so you do venture out. And uh, then you realize, you know what? That was not worth what I'm sacrificing here and might not ever have a trans- transgression again, but it's all dependent on if he's awarded that opportunity to stay in the relationship, or she, because women cheat too, so... I just, yeah, I th- I think this was, uh, like I said, we we talked a lot about this just one song. So, and there's a lot more, uh, I I guarantee that we'll we'll parse out as we listen to continuously, uh, you know, moving throughout the year. Yeah, definitely so. But let's move on to uh, brackets, which is uh, track number eight. I thought brackets was interesting in the fact that it transitioned from Kevin's heart, which is again talking about Kevin Hart's situation, Kevin Hart the comedian, and it transitioned to brackets, which is, um. Which leads with <laughs> the, the Richard Pryor skit. And, you know, it goes from, you know, Kevin Hart, who's some can say he's the king of comedy right now, who's, you know, the biggest comedian star that's, I guess, the the newest uh, star. Because I still don't think, you know, Ke- I love Kevin Hart. Don't get me wrong. I don't think he's bigger than Nate Chappelle. I don't think he's bigger than um, Eddie Murphy. Definitely not Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor is the king. He's a goat. Uh, yeah. But I just thought that interesting, that, that juxtaposition of a comedian following it with a comedian sketch in the beginning and it's talking about money and generational money how each generation the number that you get for said job is usually higher lebron's making more money than michael jordan did when he was in the nba and he's making more money than kobe kobe made more money than jordan you know that transition as as generations go those players are the people that are in those same roles tend to make more money and that aspect of it of understanding that in order to get to that change in money in the 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 amount that you're getting paid for a job there's other things that had to change in order for that to happen and that's true yeah you know saying so what are those other things one and that's where i kind of took it where the brackets um and i thought it was interesting how he did the first verse where he left the last word of the of the line open open ended you you fill it in. You fill in that bracket. And to me, what that says is what you fill that bracket in with, what you fill those, that last line in with says something about you. It's kind of like a, a psychological experiment. I'm going to say this, you fill it in, and what you fill it in with says something about you. I'm not saying it's saying something positive or negative, but it says something about you, where your mind went. It's like a Freudian slip that tells you what your consciousness or your subconsciousness was thinking. I think that line, like I said, when you put that in there, that says something about you, as well as I took the theme of brackets as transitioning, as Richard Pryor said, from one tax bracket to another. Yeah, tax bracket, yeah. Yeah, what are your feelings about it? Yeah, that's what I thought too, man. When I thought, you know, this is, so this is my, I don't have a lot of favorites. This is my favorite song. <laughs> it's a good um, album, man. It's a good album. And, you know, and shoot, I can, I can go probably for days on this one. I think a lot of the, uh, a lot of the ideas in the song were, I mean, to me, you know, I thought it was definitely was around like this idea of tax bracket because mm-hmm. he's in a different tax class. Um, shit, Uncle Sam is at his door a lot more. Mm-hmm. And the government is always going to get you for, for everything. I'm just I'm learning that as 
as just trying to start a business and, and learning about taxes, you know, from, from another side of it. Um, but the two things that really stood out to me was first one was around um, this idea of, of we all got to pay taxes is inevitable, but like the idea of like, you know, one day we should have tax, is, you know, you should be able to choose, you know, on your app, where you yeah. want to send your money to from the app on my screen. Like, that, that one that, and as an enemy, that's like the most innovative idea I thought of. Like, shit, why can't we do that? Why can't we know exactly you know, where our money's going, not just Medicaid, Medicaid, Social Security, like, exactly where and what programs are, you know, your money funding. Um, that one was most powerful, as well as, of course, the idea of, uh, <laughs> of, of, of uh, teachers, you, you know, the idea, I think, should, the, the verse was, you know, you're paying for, you know, you're paying your tax dollars to school to pay for teachers that mm-hmm. don't look like them, like, like the students. And the curriculum doesn't, you know, curriculum doesn't really support the student either. And it's kind of kind of talked about the duality of like a kid who like learning into a learning in an environment and maybe excelling in an environment that's typically like a you know to a white dominated spaces of, of a school environment and a kid who doesn't um, like learn you know the best in that particular environment and kind of how the these are those the different life trajectories will kind of the life path that they'll both go on because of that. Yeah. Um, so overall, I mean, this, this song got a lot of meaning, a lot of depth to it. Yeah, I, I definitely, and and that's those are some of the lines that stuck out to me was about the basically I'm paying I'm paying you these taxes, and you're saying these taxes are going to education, uh, but they don't even have the equipment. They don't have no books. They don't have no paper. They don't have no pencils. The teachers aren't getting paid properly. There's not enough teachers getting paid. Or enough teachers. As well as there's no teachers that represent the people that like me. I'm 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 giving you my tax money, so I would like to see my tax money used to help people that look like me as well. And I mm. I, I thought that was uh, I thought that was real, um, just just real poignant. I thought I thought that was uh, and like you said that that line about the app. Uh, I thought that was a great idea. Or well, let me rephrase that. I thought it's a. Uh, I think it is a great idea, but I do think uh, it needs to be worked out. Because if you take if you take polls on a lot of things, you'd be surprised at what the like the average person or the the poll would say we would do as a, as a whole country. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think that would need some work. But I, I definitely do think <laughs> the go- I definitely do think the government needs to be more transparent with what our tax money is going for and and how is being um allocated and i think we should also as a as a culture as a society we should be, have more input on that we do have input but i think we should have more than we do yeah i mean even yeah i agree like the, the idea should be worked out but to me you know yeah it was a novel idea, idea to try uber uber is easy you have you know you have a lot of systems that we have in place that are like Easy, accessible, you know, mm-hmm. but to following your taxes is still one of those things that are daunting, even in the verse he was mentioning that. Um, I think in the last verse, like, the mom was like, damn, I got to yeah. take my, you know, she went to a funeral for a kid. Yeah, that's. And she's like, as she was going back to the car, she's like, fuck, I got to take my, my taxes. taxes. Like, that's... it shouldn't be that daunting. It should be like, it should be as accessible as you log in and order in the Uber. Hey, I, I, def- I definitely agree with that. And I didn't even take it like that, though, but I agree with you on that. The way I took that last line, especially about, like, damn, I got to even pay my taxes, is we're ignoring the human situation again. Like, we're if, – if your child died and you have to go to their funeral, not paying your taxes that day should be okay. You know what I mean? Like, how – that's, that's where I took it was, like, we're, go, we're to the points where – we've gotten to the point so far that – that's how strong money is that you can't even grieve. Pro- she can't even grieve properly because she knows she got to yeah. pay the taxes. Like, that's true too, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like the grieving, you grieving the death of your son should take priority over taxes, but that's how much taxes weigh. And that's how much, uh, money. And, and that idea is so important or, or has is weighted so importantly in our society that she can't even grieve for her own child because she got, she's worrying about these taxes. Like that, that's what, that's how I took it. That's how I internalized it. I mean, it's almost like the idea too, you know, I think about, I remember reading a quote that was like, uh, the only thing that's promised to us is, uh, like death and taxes, yeah. right? Yeah, that's right. To the deadline, like, to me, that's not the most, the most was like, should death and, and taxes. And actually that line is fitting because that's exactly what he was highlighting, the death of her, her, her son and taxes. The two things that, like you said, the only things that, two things that um, are guaranteed, death and taxes. 
Um, yeah. Let's move on to, uh, because again, we can spend forever on each of these tracks because they're so dense and there's so much information. There's so much you can peel from it. So many connecting ties you can uh, add to what's going on in society and the world today. Uh, but the next track is um, Once an Addict, which is an interlude, but it's a, again, it's J. Cole at his storytelling at, at his best. And again, this kind of hit home just because I, I've seen a, a lot of families in situations like this. It just, it, like I said, it really hit home. From For me, this was a, a hard track to kind of listen to, a hard track to go through. Production-wise, yeah, production sonically, it's fine. It's just, uh, it, it, sonically, it's, it's, it's amazing. I'm not going to lie. Sonically, it's amazing. Sonically, it, I can listen to it, but lyrically and content-wise, it's just a little, it's, it's heavy for me. And it's not, when I say that, I don't want people to, to take it as a negative. It's just, some things are just like, Rosewood's a great movie. I can't watch it every day. It's just certain things you can't because it evokes certain emotions that, like I said, hit ho hit close to home and resonate with you. But um, the thing that I think made this uh, specific story so um, so so daunting emotionally is because of the way that he presents it and the production and everything accommodates it so well. He presents it from the perspective of from from in a first person perspective. So when you listen to it, especially people that really like try to catch every word and catch every every part of the the song you can get yourself into a place and it, it becomes dark because you feel especially if you like I said it hit home, close to home like I said when I was listening to this I was seeing myself in certain situations seeing my you know other friends going through it seeing how they were interacting with it seeing feeling all that emotional weight and as the production continues to go like you can feel the emotions of the production matching your feelings of, of of what he's saying uh so it all matches together and and you like i said it just it makes the experience more real if if you've been in a similar situation like it just makes it more real it makes it more vivid it makes it like a movie like you're living through it uh, or reliving it if if you've been in those situations so again it was hard but i think it captured the emotions and the I, I think he captured it perfectly. Uh, like there, I, I can't explain it any better than what he did in that song. Uh, mm. The emotions felt, the emotions, the anger, the frustration, even all the way to the point of guilt. Uh, it does, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Of of you could have did more, or that you should have did more, or you wanted to do more. Like all of all of those emotions, I feel were uh, captured in this particular track. Things like that. I just thought he did a very very uh, good job at expressing this story in the manner that he did, and. I've been getting the same thing from other people um, that I know that, like I said, the people that I know that made me think of this song, uh, that was they were the first people I called and, and talked to about it, and they said the same thing, is that it, it brought them back. It hurt, of course, to, to relive those situations, but it also provided um, a level of hope and, and inspiration is because they made it through it. I mean, to me, this, to me, this track really provided, like, I would say the other side of, you, the drunk use, the other side of the, the demon abuse. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't the glorification. You really didn't like kill up. Uh, there was no in internal monologue. This is like the real, yeah. this is like the real life situation of what happened. Especially, yeah, I definitely can relate to the idea of feeling guilty to, of running. Like, mm -hmm. I know he went off to you know, St. John's and, you know, when I went to college or whatever um, and, and left his mom back in, in Fayetteville. And yeah. he talked about that in a lot of his other songs as well about how he almost like he you know he fled he went home especially in this for your eyes only I forget what song that was but he definitely talked about that in his last uh, last track but I'm not I really I just relate to the idea of running for something and almost that that guilt feeling of you know you, he's trying to better himself or is he you know or is he just running from the situation yeah you know and that that was really powerful just uh to sit to sit and think about that but yeah I mean this, to me this is a real track that definitely sheds light on the the, the true the true reality of the abuse. Yeah, and that's a, uh, and and that's another thing that it made me think of. Uh, thank you for uh, for that because it, it it reminded me of that this track, like you said, it it didn't show um, any of the positives of drug use, um, only the negatives. But it also highlighted and brought to light that drug use not only hurts or drug use or addiction does not only hurt the people, the users, but it hurts the people around them, and. Mm. When when they have the the line that something has a hold on you, 
something has a hold not just on the addict of you know they they're holding on to the addiction for the drug but there's something holding on the people around you like j cole and and, and like you said yourself and myself of of the something that's holding on to us is that guilt of running or leaving or not doing more or not saying more or whatever that is but that's what's holding on us which can be holding us back from achieving uh you know levels of greatness that we we, we probably could if we let those things go so I just thought that was uh, interesting as well, that he he, ca- he captured both viewpoints, the drug users as well as uh, the people around him. The next track is uh, Friends. <laughs> uh, there's really no, no, no other segue I could do for that. But uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, after you go with um, Once an Addict, you go to Friends. And Friends has that uh, pulsating drums for me. I'll let you go first because I, I wanted to I want to I hear what you have to say about this track before I go in. You know, it's interesting, as I think about, I'm, I'm kind of like now as, as we talk through this, the track listing is very intentional, uh, yeah. how everything is laid out. Yeah. And so it's interesting how it, it ended with him him running, this idea of running into like, the start of this was like, shit, cop another bag and smoke to it. Like, yep. you know, you just pretty much, you're, you're masking, you're, you know, you went through this shit, like you saw your, your mother in the state, and now shit's the next day, and, and you're back at it. You know, you're basically back at masking that pain. Um, you don't. You didn't deal with it. So you it, just. You just like you said, masked it. Yeah, that's it. And to me, that, that's kind of what how I took this album. Sorry, I took this. Uh, took this track. Um, is I mean, so there's a lot of layers, and we can go through it. But as far as just the idea of idea of masking it, like a, idea of like going back to like back to the normal, back to like whatever I have to do just to, to get by. That is that that kind of sad and resonated with me. What I'll, what I'll say is, when I first heard this song, I had mixed reactions to it. And the reason why I mixed reactions to it is when I first heard it, I actually got defensive about it. And mm. the reason why I got defensive about it is because the way that it's presented, again, it's showing, you know, he talks about, uh, I copped a bag of smoke today. And for those out there who don't know, D-Ray smokes weed on, <laughs> on, on, a, on a regular basis. But the reason why I got defensive is because the first thing that came to my mind when, he, when that line came up and then as you go through the song, it's talking about basically using that as a coping mechanism, which is why later I came around and did get defensive. When I first, like I just, as a cannabis lover, uh, I was like, oh, he just, he, he's putting all cannabis smokers in a box and, and painting us with this stereotype that society already paints. And again, that's just my defensiveness yeah. of how society has already marred cannabis first calling it marijuana which is uh it's it's a negative connotation um instead of cannabis but now it's so used freely that it doesn't hold the same weight but uh that's kind of how that's why marijuana the name marijuana started like that but again for me dispelling those uh stereotypes especially with cannabis users uh, is is important to me because as again a cannabis user i feel like outside of the people that know me if you saw me in the streets nobody's ever came up to me and assumed that I smoked weed. Everybody's usually shocked because of the way I present myself because they're going off of those stereotypes. That's true, yeah. As well as the stereotypes of, well, if you smoke weed, all you do is sit around, eat, and watch movies all day. And again, anybody that knows me knows that is the last thing I'm doing. You know, I, I got several jobs and I work them very hard. And uh, so just just dispelling those stereotypes but like I said, once I got past that and I really analyzed what he was saying, he wasn't just he wasn't picking on cannabis, in essence. But that is easy to go to. But he's he's talking about multiple types of drugs and just coping mechanisms. I felt as a whole, that's your friend, is that coping mechanism? It can be weed, it can be alcohol, it can be in some people's case caffeine, working out, whatever it is. Anything to excess yeah. can be bad for you. Anything to excess can be bad for you. Shit, you can die of drinking water. If you drink too much water too fast in a, in a short period of time, you'll die. So I just, like I said, once I got past that and I really started analyzing what he was saying, he's he's right. You, it's about the intentions of what you're using that vice for. I don't I don't use cannabis as a as a uh, to help alleviate you know me feeling sad or angry or if I had a bad day, oh I got to go smoke. No, I'm gonna smoke if I have a bad day or a good day. That's just my thing. That's I enjoy it. That's that's. I get down. Some people have a glass of wine. I have a joint. It is what it is. But again, when it's yeah. when you get to the point of using it as a coping mechanism or you using it to mask your your feelings, then that's a problem. But again, like I said, that can be anything. If you're using alcohol as a coping mechanism, that's a problem. 
multiple aspects uh, of things can be used as coping mechanisms that can be negative. And that's what I think, that's what I took away from this. And I think it is important to understand why you're using what you're using and not use it as a coping mechanism. And I also like the fact that he brought up about meditating. I don't, yeah. I, I do meditate, but I, I don't think I meditate quite in the regard that he's talking about. Uh, for me, it's just like, I just take periods of the time of the day just to really like, just to calm my mind and to just like meditate and try to focus on what I need to do for me, for me as an individual, what I need to do, what I need to focus on. And it helps. It helps me. It helps calm my mind and refocus or recenter myself. Now I'm not telling everybody to do it, but I don't really see any downside to doing it. <laughs> so, yeah. And I thought that's what I think, Um, you know, the idea of like, Medicaid don't med- meditate, don't Medicaid. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, let's just prescribe. It's like, you know, I think you mentioned that in the verse, like, you know, whatever you do to get away, everyone has to have some type of coping, me- you know, coping, me- coping mechanism because, like, your life is hard. Mm-hmm. Everybody goes through different things. But like, are you using it to, like, medicate yourself from, like, that, that pain? Yeah. Are you doing like to, or you, or are you doing it to meditate? I think that's a problem. You have to kind of just be real with yourself and everyone. Just like, are you, you know, what are you using it for? Mm-hmm. Um, what purpose is it for? But and I, I feel you. I don't want to like, you know, see, I smoke weed as well. And like, you know, I, I don't want to make sure like, you know, it's not all the time. It's like whenever I should, whenever I want to, or whenever I feel you know, feel like, you know, I just want to chill, or whatever. But it's the the idea that as long as that's not a, a, a my vice, as long as that's not a, a no for me, it's like a, a crush. I've always thought about that too. As long as it's, as it's a crush, like you said, it's something where I can meditate with my mind. Um, just kind of get my day started for the next, you know, moving forward. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, that's exactly, like I said, now for me, like, I ain't gonna lie. Like I said, I smoke weed shit every day. And the, the, <laughs> I'm not, no, I'm not gonna lie. I smoke weed every day, multiple times a day. That's, that's, that's my thing. But I know, and I'm aware of it enough that, like I said, I don't use it as a coping mechanism. If I get upset, I don't go, damn, I, I got to go smoke now. No, that's not for me. I mean, I was going to smoke anyway. So <laughs> like that yeah. is it's just of getting it to the point where you understand the reason behind why you're doing it. If you're not using it for a coping mechanism, just like the same thing with alcohol. Yeah, exactly. You know, you can drink a glass. Like I said, people drink a glass of wine every day and it's not a big deal, but they don't see uh, a joint in the same way. And we can go into the health aspects of it and all that, whatever. My point remains is if you're using it in the same manner of, like you said, not a cl- not a clutch or a coping mechanism, and you're just using it as, uh, you know, recreationally. And in some cases, for medical reasons, like it can help with anxiety. It can help with depression. It can help with insomnia, other medical treatments. So it's about really understanding, like you said, the use of it. If you really, if it's, if it's using for a medical condition, like anxiety, depression, that has been determined and you're working with either a licensed physician or somebody that knows what they're doing to make sure that, you know, you're having the right strand, the right dosage, whatever it is to make sure that it's working in the manner that it should be and not as a coping mechanism or not as a crutch, then I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And that's just, that's my view. And I would love to hear what uh, our followers have to say in regarding to that, that idea. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be good. Especially, yeah. Especially when I did, you know, I don't know what you got from this album. Does he smoke weed or, or does he drink? Any? I, didn't, I, I don't that, know if he's like... Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know. I, I I don't know. I mean, and to be honest, I never really... Until you said it, I never really thought about it with J. Cole. Like, hmm. I never thought he did or he didn't. It just never really came up. And, and to, nah. to, in all fairness, in, for me, it doesn't matter <laughs> if he does or doesn't. It's just... Because, again, I think... I took it defensively just because that, like I said, that speaks about me, me, the, me internalizing that way speaks about me of, like I said, I took it defensively because I get it all the time, especially in, in the professional setting that I'm in, that stigma is, is, is heavy and it's, it's frustrating, especially when you see a lot of productive people that, uh, use cannabis, just like people use, um, alcohol productively yeah. or, or, uh, you know. Uh, responsibly, I should say. Let's go to Window Pain, and then only two more tracks. <laughs> uh, window Pain, uh, for me, definitely had a ominous feeling in the production, and and then after the bridge, again, you feel that energy, and then 
you feel this this energy and frustration and and you kind of get in the mindset and this is uh this is actually the track I was talking about with uh, the girl uh expressing her story uh, about her brother and Cole really brings us into that world of uh what that girl is dealing with and and from her brother's perspective of walking in the streets of Dreamville or uh, Fayetteville rather it was just an interesting story if it, it gave me similar feelings of what it did um for for your eyes only that 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 last track and the way it was the way it ended to me was the most most interesting uh, part of that. Like it really just showed me the way that the little girl talked about and the optimism and hope that she had, just like yeah. re- really really propelled to me. Especially after the what she just dealt with this, her brother being shot, almost being killed. Like for her to be that optimistic really just shows that hatred and malice is taught. Like it to me, it, it show it it highlighted to me that it has to be taught because for her to be so again optimistic in this dark dark situation, I, I can't I can't determine what else what else would bring that for her to still have that light besides that she doesn't have any hate in her heart. Like it can be easy to to hate somebody for like I said shooting your brother almost killing him, and she's everything she said was so positive. Um, that's really what that's really what I took away from it. It just it gave, it gave me hope and inspiration that the innocence, yeah, that there, that there is innocence, and and if we can just continue to try to foster that more, uh, and bring that more to the light, we can maybe make some substantial and long lasting changes. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think the the, the outro was always at the end, but then um, just like the the dialogue was like that was like the most chill. I almost chill just thinking about like. That was some pretty deep questions they asked around, you know, yeah. why God, why why does God do things, or why does God let bad things happen to good people? And kind of her response was like pretty powerful, you know, like yeah. she said, very like very hopeful, you know, <laughs> no makes you makes you feel good even about even though the story we just heard was yeah. it was a tough story to listen to as well. Yeah, it was tough, but the hearing like the optimism at the end, didn't really think about how that plot flowed into it, but I can definitely see that it does not give you. I love that 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 song. I didn't, you know, I didn't feel the same way I felt on the other track about uh, I forget the the, the, the uh, interlude track, mm-hmm. but um, uh, once I added. felt left this one feeling, yeah, I left I felt you know left this one feeling a lot more, a lot more optimistic. So I feel you on that one. Yeah, and I, I the same thing here. I felt a lot more optimistic on this one than I did on Once an Attic, and I think, like I said before, um, I think that's a good way to kind of end the album. Because if you end it on with it so dark, that might put people in a position to be like, "Well, fuck it, <laughs> like uh, it's not gonna change. Yeah. It's not gonna yeah, change. Yeah. So yeah, I'm gonna just ride this out and and live what it is." But with that, with that glimpse of hope, that glimpse of light, it, it, it gives you hope that you know, I, I I should keep doing what I'm doing to to try to help bring this innocence, bring this light to to more and, and give it more power. Um, I thought was very, very important and adds to this project because, again, remember in the beginning it's telling you to choose wisely and there's pro- is providing an option for you to choose. It's giving you, it's giving mm-hmm. you, a, 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 it's giving you an option of light, uh, of positivity. And it's interesting when I think about the choice, sometimes it's not even a, you know, it's also the mindset as well. Yeah. Like, you know, you choose, choose the mindset that you – you know, again, things are going to happen. Like pain happens, like you're just a part of life. But you, you, you know, you choose how you cope. But you choose the mindset that you have to deal with it. I just feel like you know, life circumstances prevent us, and that little, you know, little voice in our head prevents us from making the right decisions. But yeah, like definitely how, how we think about things, how we perceive things, only has a choice. And and that that, that touches back on what I was saying earlier about about happiness. And happiness is a state of being. It's you have you have the choice to be happy. Yeah. That's one of the overarching things that I took from this and, and that I've kind of felt for a long time. And it just felt like this um, kind of solidified uh, w- what I've been thinking is that happiness is in the state of mind. Yes, of course, we're always going to there's going to be points of sadness, anger, frustration, all those other emotions. But at the end of the day, I've literally chosen to be happy in, in certain situations. Like I just uh, said, you know, I can't change. Yeah. I can't change this. So. I'm I'm gonna focus on the positive. I'm gonna focus on the things that I, I can change, I can affect, that I so I can be happy. That's that's one of the one of the things that I took from this. And again, uh, I think this 
Because in, in essence, I felt like this was the last track of, of the album. <laughs> yeah, I feel like this was like, this was to me like the closing of the album, even though 1985 was like kind of a, a, a little teaser at the end. But um, I mean, yeah, so th- I think this wraps up really nicely, kind of fits it all together. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Now, getting into 1985, the question that I wanted to ask you is, you know how it says 1985 and then the intro to the fall off is my prediction. And I want to, again, see what you think is that the fall off is going to be another mixtape because think about it, his mixtape, the come up, uh-huh. the warm up, the fall up, like the come up, the warm up. And then like, uh, I just feel like it's like a transition to like his mixtapes are kind of giving the idea of his journey and then his studio albums is just like messages he wants to say. Yeah, I can see that. I can and, see that. And so I, I, was, I was because especially the the feel and everything about 1985 does not feel, fit KOD to me. Except not at all. except for the concept of trying to educate and elevate younger people. And younger people, I mean the younger rappers, Little Pumps, Smoke Perp, that aspect of it. That's the only connection that I got to KOD for 1985. Did yeah, you... I mean, it didn't it didn't fit like, you know, to me, I can see the fit if it was may, may, maybe, you know, a little higher in the track list, but because it was like the end, um, I assume that it was more of like a, you know, teaser track for something else. Like, it, it makes sense it could be like the intro to like the next, uh, a mixtape that he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna drop or whatever, but no, it, it really didn't fit in terms of like the flow of it. Yeah. Um, but I definitely see like the same themes around you know, this idea of maybe not money, but fame, mm-hmm. you know, or the idea of popularity. Like, you can jump on the, the wave, but, you know, the wave isn't going to, you know, it's only going to take you so far. It's like, you know, don't stop your dumb, don't quit your day job kind of thing. Like, that's how, how I took this track. I mean, I, I love this one. This was, this was good, too. Very satirical, very funny. And kind of painted out the idea of, like, kind of OG kind of schooling, like, yeah. schooling the younger artists about what to do, what not to do. Just give them some game yeah, about Yeah, exactly. Like, I'm just, just trying to put you on some game. <laughs> Yeah, um, so it, it, it was good. I'm interested to know. Like, what, I don't know, you know, if he who he was talking to, or I guess he had. I don't remember if somebody mentioned him in a previous song or whatever. Because it seemed like he was very targeted or directed at someone. From what I, from the research that I did, is I, it seems like it's supposed to be towards Little Pump and uh, Smoke Perp because they both had uh, tracks. I think last year, or yeah, last year that had lines with um i think one of the lines i think it was for smoke part was like fuck j cole i don't remember the la- the rest of the line i think it was directed at both of them uh the thing that i did first on the projection production side it had that a tribe called quest definitely uh late 80s early 90s kind of feeling the production and especially the cadence of flow is like it had that playful yeah like y'all don't want to fuck with me i got you know you know i i got the skills but I'm gonna just I'm gonna just throw this out there. This is light work for me. <laughs> like that's how I felt. Um, and I'm just trying to give you a little bit of game because at the end of the day, I'm gonna be here. We'll see if you will. <laughs> we'll see if you will. I'm gonna be here. And the other thing that I did take from this is uh, the line that really really caught my eyes was uh, the lines where he's talking about you know have your fun. You know I was 18 once. I was young. I was dumb. Just out here just to have fun, listen to music, chase girls, uh, get money, all of that. But you'll get to a point where, you know, you'll elevate, you'll grow, you'll, you'll evolve into getting, um, you know, expanding your thoughts and, and your, your, uh, the breadth of the conversation further, because he's basically saying like, I'm a 33 year old man. You're an 18 year old kid. I don't expect you to get and understand the mentality that I'm coming from. Cause you're not there yet. You'll get there and then you understand what I'm saying, but you're not oh, there yet. Yeah. And I'm not going to hate on you because you don't get that. But at the same time, you have a responsibility. Don't degrade your community. Don't degrade where you came from in the guise of just having fun. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't you don't have to do that. And you can still have fun and still talk about all the shit you're talking about. But at the end of the day, in order to evolve and grow and to stay in this game, you're gonna have to get you're gonna have to work on that craft. You're gonna have to work on that content. You're gonna have to be elevate your mind in order to, to be long lasting. Because that's what the greats do. And that's how I kind of took it. And like I said, the lines that took out to me was about, you know, trying to uplift your community. Um, that's really what stuck out to yeah. me in, in that. And like he was saying, he's like, 
and, and the other aspect of it is similar to what Jay-Z said on 444. He's like, I'm not telling these cats not to, to flaws. I'm not telling them not to do that. I'm just saying, I not going to do that. <laughs> yeah. Like that's not yeah. for me because I'm in a different point in my life. And th- like, like we said before that, you know, hip hop is balanced. As long as you have, you know, you can have your fun songs. We had, we had our fun songs, um, shit, 50 cent in the club. He ain't talking about shit in that song. <laughs> like, <laughs> nah, nah. you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. So yeah. there's places for it. It's just when you get into the the realm of pushing one more than the other or pushing one so much that you're ignoring the positives of the other, especially if that one is negative or it's perpetual. Remind me negative. about the, of their brackets a little bit. Like mm-hmm. at each bracket, at each stage is going to be, you know, there's going to be different things you deal with, different conversations you have. Um, so to me, this was definitely like you're in this kind of bracket right now. You know, do your thing and, and you know, well, eventually you'll get to this bracket and you'll see what's up. Like, I can't knock you for each day. I can't knock you for, for what you're doing, what you're saying. Just know that there's more to it. There. There's more to the story um, that you have to understand. And I mean, she's real. If I think about a lot of the artists who, I mean, from our era, from now in this era, there's a lot of like, you know, one hit wonders that came, who rode a wave, the wave changed, but didn't have an originality or style to it. And you, 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 you die out. I um, mean, so, it's kind of been awesome real game. I, I, I appreciated it. Yeah, I did too. I thought I thought this was, uh, overall, I, th- I really think this is a really good album. There's really no song that I, I, I can say I didn't like. I enjoyed the production on, on, on the whole project. It's The production is, uh, the BPMs is a little bit is lower, but that's what you expect from J. Cole. We really haven't yeah. got high BPMs from him for a while. I would say probably Friday Night Lights. Uh, no, actually... Uh, a side story. I think there were some with higher BPMs, but anyways, I think this was a from production point. Uh, I thought it was really well done. Um, from concept lyrical aspect, I thought it was uh, a one. Um, what you would expect from J Cole, the the breadth of information that he provided, and the introspection and the thoughtfulness was I thought was it's pretty amazing how he as much think about we talked about a lot in this time and we still didn't get through everything that he put in that in that album and for him to condense it down to 12 tracks 43 minutes uh, i thought that's pretty pretty impressive yeah it is incredible i mean i'm gonna be sitting I mean, i'm gonna sit with this for a while like i think the standout track for me was definitely brackets and that was it was just yeah. layers a lot of stuff in that i mean every everyone every song in here has a lot of layers to it i opportunity just right now i'm gravitating to that but shoot two 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 weeks from now it could be a whole different track, but yeah, that's, um, for me, the, when I first yeah. heard it, the cutoff that was that was my go to track. I was like, like I said, I thought the whole album was good, but when that came on, it just I just felt the energy uh, in me like that it was resonating with me. And then um, yeah. as of as of this week, the same thing with you. With brackets has been like I was like, oh my gosh, like I was sleeping on brackets when I really wasn't. It just yeah. it's gonna gravitate with you differently. And then. Um, and then when I had a conversation with one of my friends and then Kevin Hart became, so it's going to, it is going to change and grow. And that is the great thing about music. Well, good music. It should grow with you. You it should, should, yeah. You I should peel out more. Yeah. Brackets was just my, you know, it just became my, my track like yesterday. It kind of <laughs> hit me. But first it was Kevin's Hart. Like that was what I was playing. I was making like all my friends. I had to send out, send it to people. Like, <laughs> you heard this song. Y'all like, got to hear this. Yeah. That was it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it changes. It, it evolves on you. So, yeah, I want to say, um, first I want to say thank you, man, for uh, coming on and, and, and breaking this down with me. Uh, I definitely appreciate your insight. I definitely wouldn't have been able to take it to the, the places I would have if I if I did it alone. So I, I definitely appreciate your input. And, man, it was a good conversation. And like I said, um, it makes me want to go listen to the album again and see the different perspectives that you were talking about that I didn't quite pick up on and just to flesh it out even more. Uh, it's no problem. Next time you have to have me on, uh talk about Kanye West and this, uh, Make America Great Again stuff. Oh, Lord. Actually, actually, <laughs> be- before we get out of here, I do want to ask you a quick question. Uh, with all that Kanye social buzz that's going out right now, are you still going to listen to those albums that he talked about? So the albums that he's coming out with. Yeah, the albums that he's coming out Well, the, all the albums that he's producing in his own album. Are you going to listen to any yeah. or all of those? I'm going to listen to pretty much every, every one of them. Me too. That's what I said. I, I said, I don't care what Kanye I'm says. I'm separating the art from the artist. <laughs> Hey, you're crazy, but let's see if your art's if your art is good. <laughs> yeah, I think he's. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with him, but I'm I'm there for it. 
Exactly. So, uh, like I said, I want to say, uh, everybody, you should definitely go check out the J. Cole album. It's called K.O.D., as we stated. It has three different meanings. Uh, please give us your insight, your opinions. Let us know what you thought about this podcast. If there's any meanings or points that we didn't brought up that you thought we should have. And just, you know, break down the break down the album with us. Let us know. Definitely follow us on Instagram and Twitter. And please, please give us a five-star review on iTunes and subscribe on YouTube. You don't know how much that means, and it is, is appreciated. So again, I want to say thank you to Jason. Great conversation. You know our motto. Live, listen to some great music, and above all, love more. And we out. Mm-hmm.